Good evening, ballers. Welcome to the 77th episode of The Step Back. Joe Leon Tonkins, my main man, Jacob Moses, and Happy New Year to you and all yes, those sir. out there. Joining us tonight, uh, our good friend, dear Life Group, Value Life Group member, Freddie Forte. How you doing, brother? Yo, what's good, y'all? Sure, good to have you Everything's on. good, man. Happy New Year to you. Merry Christmas. All that hey. good stuff. Likewise, man. Glad to be here. Yeah, no, uh, our pleasure. You know, I uh, want to kick off a new year, start off right. Uh, you know, be you yourself a big Laker fan. Wanted to get your thoughts on that dumpster fire out in L.A. <laughs> and, you know, um, it, it just... We, you've been in the life groups for, you know, quite a while. Well, it's like, well, it's like its inception. And, you know, we, we share a lot of thoughts together. Uh, you share your family and all. And, and it's uh, finally good to get you on screen and get your thoughts. And just want to tell you how much we appreciate you. Yeah, well, I appreciate you, even though you just, you know, referred to my team as a dumpster fire. Even though it's true, <laughs> it still kind of stings a little bit. But, uh, yeah, man, hey, I'm – I'm really glad that I got into the life groups. My boy, Corey, uh, Corey and I have been, you know, we've been Facebook friends for you know, like eight years or whatever. And we started out in trash talk groups and then, you know, he ended up in the life groups and um, it's, it's been refreshing to get away from trash talking, even though we still talk a lot of smack to one another, but it's just more <laughs> about like, just talking about sports and just having like, you know, legitimate conversations and stuff like that, that, you know, it, it's been, it's been a lot more refreshing to be a part of that. So, you know, and then getting connected in all the other life groups has been really cool too. So yeah, mm -hmm. definitely happy to be, you know, a part of the life group uh, family. Definitely happy to be here. Just ready to, you know, talk some ball and uh, just have some fun. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so you're a big Laker fan. We know you got the championship back in 2020. We're going to call it yes, your indeed. bubble year. Uh, much like the Dodgers. Uh, yes. Shortened season champions. We'll Absolutely. Count it. <laughs> Uh, oh, I count all of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you yeah. become a Laker fan? So I'm originally from Compton. Uh, not even originally. I'm from L.A. County. So, you know, I'm, I'm a California kid, West Coast kid. Um, I was not a Lakers fan to begin with. I'm one of those. And it was just really weird. California, especially like L.A., in the early 90s, you know, late 80s, early 90s, there wasn't much to no, – not even late 80s, early 90s. There wasn't much to cheer for when it came to Lakers. You know, after uh, Jordan, you know, stopped the Lakers, whatever, they were done. Magic retired and stuff like that. Dodgers were trashed since 88. There wasn't much to cheer for. So, at first, I was actually a Bulls fan because, like, I, my very first taste of watching the NBA was the mm -hmm. NBA Finals. And all my family were going for the Lakers. And I don't know, I, I remember seeing, like, this fan, this huge, like, mega Bulls fan, with a, um, they had the backyard and like the garden and everything was, it was the shape of a bull and uh, it was all red and stuff. Like it looked just like the bull. And I just like, I love the colors, you know, I love Michael Jordan or whatever. I'm a Bulls fan. So my first eight years in sport, in basketball, I was a Bulls fan. Like, I mean, that's just what it was. When mm -hmm. MJ retired, I reverted back to California. So I can go ahead and say that I am a legitimate Lakers fan. Because I became a fan of the Lakers before they won their first championship, um, you know, after, you know, what was it? I can't remember the last Showtime title or whatever. So I became a fan <laughs> when they were still trash, but they were on their way back. Uh, but I've been a fan since um, 98. So, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, right before Shaq got there and Kobe and stuff like that. Like, I mean, I, I really started to lock in and uh, and that's kind of when, you know, that's when my, my fandom started for, for the Lakers. And I've been a fan ever since. There we go. Hey, that's what's up. I mean, I mean, there's another team in town. You know, the Clippers. I mean, I'm pretty sure they, they ever crossed your mind. Who? San Diego? <laughs> San Diego Clippers? <laughs> oh yeah, San Diego. Yeah, yeah. Bro, I went. Okay, so I probably went to one Lakers game. Like, and, and that's funny. Lakers fan, but I've never gone to that many like live games. I went to probably one as a kid. I actually went to one as. Uh, like a Clippers game too. We didn't even watch that game. We were walking around the arena and stadium. Great rest of four, man. There, there was nothing else there. Like I'm trying to, you know, watch my mouth. <laughs> but like, I remember just walking around, 
they had a chance to hit a buzzer beater to beat the Timberwolves back then. I think uh, Garnett was on the team at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, missed a shot. I'm like, yeah, that's typical Clippers. But, no, <laughs> under no circumstances. They have cool colors. Um, they kind of, you know, try to do some different things now. They're kind of trash now. But uh, that's it. They had nice colors. But, you know, never at any point had I ever been a fan of Clippers. Even last year when they got to the Western Conference Finals for the first time, I still wasn't a fan of the Clippers. No, nah, I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite player uh, all the time on the Lakers? Kobe. Um, and that, you know, that, that's a, I mean, that's basically because I grew up as a Lakers fan with Kobe there. You know, I, I had NBA courtside, the first one, mm-hmm. not two. Mm-hmm. Two was trash. Two nope. looked like trash. I was good. <laughs> but I had Kobe, you know, NBA courtside featuring Kobe Bryant, man. I played that game for like three years and I got it. Um, <laughs> you know, he was, he was amazing, you know. And then, obviously, he had the scandal and stuff like that, you know, and you could see that he was very cocky. He was not a humble person by any means. But he showed me that that's okay. You don't have to be this humble person. I think humility is great for people who want to do it, but, you know, they try to make it this unwritten rule that you have to be this way, you have to be graceful. No, trash talk. Like, talk shit to people. Like, I mean, just do, like, do that. That's what he was. He had that mentality, that Mamba mentality. That's who he was. And you could see it when he was young. You could see it as he got older and matured, man. You had to be on his level, you know, and that, yep. that rubbed people the wrong way. I mean, it definitely cost us some titles. You know, Shaq ended up leaving, um, you know, being traded, you know, not being able to win when you had Carl Malone and Gary Payton there. Like, that was crazy in itself. Um, you know, just all that stuff, like, people not wanting to play there because of how Kobe was. But – that's who he was like it was just like look I'm not taking a pay cut I'm just gonna be me or whatever you know I loved every every bit of that you know I I rocked with it so like Kobe was he's my all-time Lakers uh, great in my eyes yeah I I hear you and that's a team with such great history you know Magic, Kareem, Kobe, Shaq and now LeBron there Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and like the, the Mamba mentality I don't think was embraced fully until after his retirement and then more so unfortunately in his untimely death as to where his, uh, his moxie, his mentality now onto the younger generation. But obviously in that time, you know, look at his arrogance and, and cockiness, but you look at the, the athletes in that era, the Jordans, the Kobe's, the Mike Tyson's, uh, that's what it took to be great. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you see that like, and, and the big thing is look, You've seen NBA players die since, you know, like, I mean, like they, they died early, died young. Mm-hmm. Like Lorenzo Wright, like I, you know, don't remember him completely as a player, but I remember hearing his name all the time when I played courtside and stuff like that. His passing, you know, that whole story there. I recommend if you don't know much about what happened to Lorenzo Wright, uh, definitely go to Wikipedia because his oh, story yeah, was really tragic. Yeah. That is mm-hmm. so bizarre. Oh, yeah. That's so crazy. Um was it Razul Butler, I think, was one? Like, you know, yeah. the car accident with uh, his, you know, significant other who was on American Idol and stuff like that. Like, these people, like, I remember them, and I remember, you know, like, what happened to them, but it's just, like, Kobe is a different story. You know, yeah. it's like he, he, these guys paying tribute to him and everything like that. They say, you know, I grew up watching Kobe, and, you know, <clears throat> I idolized him. And, you know, like, this, this really hurts. The impact that he had. You know, to see Doc Rivers, who was, you know, he was a rival through and through. A rival as a, you know, as a coach for the Celtics, rival as a coach for the Clippers. Like, I mean, that's that was, like, the rival. That man was in tears when Kobe died. That's big. I mean, that, that, that's big right there. You know what I mean? Doc, I, I love Doc as a coach. and He's a great, you know, coach. I mean, well, he's a decent coach. I don't want to say great. But, you know, he's a decent coach. But he's a stand-up guy, man. So, to see that his heart right there. I mean, that was big, bro. When I um, I saw the notification that Kobe um, died and I saw that it was TMZ, I'm like, nope, TMZ, y'all are always mm-hmm. right, but I'm not I'm not doing this one. Like, leave mm-hmm. me alone. Like, I, I tried to click. I went to Wikipedia because like, you always got to go to Wikipedia because, that you know, even though it's not a legitimate source in some people's eyes, it, it they're usually not wrong either. So I saw it, and people were trying to message me and text me. No, I put my phone on, you know, like, I, I shut down. I was like, nah, don't talk to me. I don't want to. I sat on my couch for the next, like, 10 hours. Just not. I, I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> I just I, I can't do it. You know, it's um, it, it was rough, man. That was a, that was a rough moment for me. Like it's it's big, you know. What I mean, but you're right. Like that mentality, just knowing like Mama's mentality and stuff like that, um, was embraced so much more 
after he stopped playing the game. But like you said, definitely even more, you know, after his death, you know, it's just um, he impacted the game a lot. And um, it's going to take a while for people to, you know, to kind of let that, you know, die down. And that's Mm -hmm. that's that's going to be around for a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It will. You know, so you win a championship in 2020, get to this year's team, high expectations. Uh, it's a big three now of AD, LeBron, and Westbrook. What are your thoughts on this year's team? I, it's hard because I've come to accept that the level we're playing at is the level that we're going to be at. And that's an unfortunate thing to think. But when you have AD, LeBron, you got Russ, you have Carmelo, you have an amazing group of support players and you can't win games and you can't beat teams you should be beating, that's mm-hmm. a problem. You can, you can go, you know, try to trade some people, but you made so many deals to where it's not going to be feasible to try to make a trade that's actually going to make sense. You can't trade off, you know, draft picks and stuff like that because you did that to get AD. You did that to get mm-hmm. Russ. You did that to get these players that, you know, not they're not necessarily past their prime, but it's just a matter of it's going to be hard to find money to get players that are going to be able to do what they need to do. So you're scraping at the barrel, um, at the bottom of the barrel, to try to find, you know, better players. And you got, like I said, decent players, but they're old. Like, I'm 37. LeBron is a few weeks younger than I am. He's 37. You, you got these players that are nearing their, you know, mid to late 30s, almost 40. It's not a great recipe to have everybody that age and starting the show. Like there's so many miles on these legs that it's just, it's, it's just not going to work. So seeing all these other teams that are doing well or whatever, I'm, I'm not jealous. Cause again, I saw my team win a championship. It was a shortened season, but hell, we didn't have an opportunity. We almost didn't get to see the se- season complete. So we were able to do something. We had to put it in a bubble. You still had to show up. You still had to play the games and we had the better team and we won it. And I'm happy. We tied the Celtics. Uh, with most championships in NBA history, I'm happy about that. Do I think LeBron wins one more championship before he retires or before he ends his uh, term as Laker? No. I just I, – unfortunately, I don't see it happening because we have the players that we have now, and that's basically how it's going to be because you're not going to take a pay cut. You know, AD's not going to take one. It's just that That's just kind of where we are. We're going to have to do a massive trade overhaul to get some of these players for that to even be, you know, an option. I just don't see it happening. It's, this is interesting because in the beginning of the season, uh, I, I was up the logic, like, <clears throat> um, I defended the Westbrook move, figuring it would take some miles off LeBron's legs. Uh, we know Westbrook isn't a shooter, but he's very good at keeping up pace. The rest of the team, uh, the DeAndre Jordan, the Dwight Howards, they're old, slow, can't defend pick and roll. And the Lakers have been much better recently using LeBron at the five. Although it's, I, you know, right. I can't see it feasible over a long stretch of the season. Uh-uh. But, uh, you know, in the offseason, they declined a the deal for Buddy Heald, passed on DeRozan. Uh, we're, I guess hindsight being 2020, would you have done those moves over Westbrook? I was sitting here excited thinking that, you know, we got the deal for Buddy. I think but the Buddy Heel deal was the most viable option. I think that was yep. the best option. And even as mm-hmm. you were talking about Russ, I'm sitting here thinking, should have got Buddy. In my mind, mm-hmm. we should have got Buddy. And then I saw that we got Russ. I'm like, oh, hell, okay, we got Buddy and Russ. That's interesting. I don't see that working, but okay, fine. I'm like, oh, no, wait. We got Russ instead of Buddy. I'm like, huh, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, Russ gets to come home. That's awesome. You know, he's a L.A. kid. Okay, you know. I'm, I feel like I was trying to convince myself, talk myself into the fact that this is a good deal. Yes, we got Trevor Ariza back. Ariza won a title with us in 2009. You know, it's been forever. <laughs> that was 11 years ago, man. 10 years ago, like 12 years ago. Like, that was a long time ago. Like, that that was not the same player. Like, he was explosive then, and he's still good now, but 12 years has passed since that last title, That he, the last time he won a title. I'm sitting there like, all right, we got Dwight Howard back, but this was a year after, you know, he went to Philly. That whole thing, him <laughs> being a Laker for a third time, 
just tickles me. That's funny. <laughs> DeAndre Jordan, that would have been a good, you know, that would have been a good pickup, you know, five, six years ago. I'm looking at these mm-hmm. players. We got Rondo. I'm just like, and the more and more I'm looking at it, like, we are old as hell. Like, this is not really going to, like, I mean, this ain't going to work for us. And I, I wanted it to work. I still want it to work. I don't see us getting past, even if somehow we make it into the playoffs, we get bumped, we get bounced out of the first or second round. It's not going to go any further. We have to make trades to make this happen. It's just not going to work. AD is not aggressive enough to, to do things. He's the nuts and shit. You know, it's just he's accident prone. Like, he's injury prone. Um, you know, like I said, Braun can't do it all. Like, he's still putting up monster numbers, but he can't do it all. You know, people are letting Russ shoot shots. I mean, that's 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 really bad. You win an MVP, you get a season with triple-double after triple-double, you know, average and stuff like that, and people are just letting you shoot. That's that's not good. So it's just, you know, they know that you're not going to make shots. So it's just we're not in a position to win a title this year, and I've come to accept that. And that's fine because there were years where that's just how it was. You know, I was a fan when we had Kareem Rush, <coughs> when we had uh, <laughs> Kwame Brown. Like, I don't know how we <laughs> ended up with Kwame Brown. <laughs> Kwame when we had Kwame Brown. Like, where the fuck does that dude come from? Like, I mean, those are the people we had on our team. I remember when we had um, Julius Randle, like his rookie, yes. you know, his rookie mm-hmm. year. And he got injured on his first game first and was play. out for the rest of the season. I remember those years. Like, I've been a fan through some of the craziest stuff, man. So I get it. So I'm happy that I've seen my, you know, my Lakers win six championships, you know, since I've been a fan, but it's just a matter of, I understand at the same time that that's not going to be something that's going to be around. The league is, mm-hmm. you know, is growing and evolving, you know, and, and that's the biggest thing. You, when we won in 2020, we had a perfect blend of being able to um, attack small ball and have bigs. And it's just a matter of, it's not working. That option is not mm-hmm. working, especially because we have a lot of veteran guys. Like everybody's a veteran, like they're all old guys. Mm-hmm. It's just not something that's going to happen this year. I've come to accept it, um, you know. I won't admit it outside of this podcast, you know, but, you know, yeah, I, I come to accept that, that, <laughs> that it's just not going to be our gear. That's okay. That's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll play this tape over and over again. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, I just have to add in, we don't call him AD around here anymore. It is Street Clothes. That is his name. <laughs> Until he is back and healthy. It is Street Clothes. All right. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, I guess you're going to call him that for the rest of the season because there's no telling when he's actually going to be back and be healthy. He might be 25% when he comes back, you know. <laughs> such a disappointment, man. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. like last year, that you know, when he got hurt, I mean, that – I mean, we weren't going to beat the Suns anyway, but, like, that was a – that, that mm-hmm. took the wind out of the sails, like, big time in game six, man. So, it's just like mm-hmm. – that was just frustrating, thinking, you know, to see us flame out in the first round. That just – I was not expecting that. But to see now that we're probably not even going to make the playoffs, it's just like, okay, that's fine. That's what it was year one of, you know, with LeBron. So it's just – it's all good. We got an older LeBron, and we were very fortunate to to see a title, you know, take place in L.A. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'll, I'll take that. You know, we'll probably, what, three, four more years of this, and then we'll see what happens. But, <laughs> yeah. So, LeBron, this week, finally passing 36,000 points at the uh, – age 37, year 19. Uh, his time, what would you believe, what do you think his legacy would be uh, in L.A.? That's a great question. I'm not a, I'm not a homer. Like, I try to be unbiased as much as possible. But, like, I can understand for many Laker fans who are probably – I have you. I remember like when they did the mural of LeBron and they defaced it, and then the guy went back and fixed it, and they defaced it again, and he did it one more time, and they defaced it again. That's what everyone feels about, you know. Like I mean, half the half the Laker fans they feel that way about LeBron. This man is still busting his ass to try to get out there and play, and he's risking injury and stuff like that, trying to get back and stuff. He's putting the team on his back, putting up these numbers, but to half the fans, they're not gonna. They're not going to be, if you know, they, they're not they're not big on him. You know, he's gone from team to team. He's stacked the stacked the deck with players that he wanted to play with. Um, many people are just going to look at him as, you know, he's just ring chasing and all this other stuff. I'm here for that, and that's the biggest thing. As, as much as people try to say, you know, 
um, that's a bad thing. It's not. You got to look at it this way. The, the governors in the NBA, because we don't call them owners anymore, the governors, they make so much money. They're going to make a ton of money no matter what and no matter who's going to be there. The loyalty card is not a thing anymore. To sit there and look at a look at a player and say, "Oh, you should be at this, you know, be here for your entire career because we love you as a player and yada yada yada." But teams are not doing what they need to do to set them up to win championships like that. That's unfair. Mm-hmm. That's unfair mm-hmm. to say to anybody. And if we were in that same situation, would you stay there if you had an opportunity to make more money or win a ring with someone else, play with the people you want to play with, you know, work on those things? You would want that too. So for me, my opinion, this man, this is a, a black man who came from a single family, you know, single parent household who has carved his own identity and set his, and blazed his own trail in the mm-hmm. league. He stands up for us. He stands up for the people who can't speak. He calls out people when they're doing things wrong or whatever. Like he's very verbal. He's very vocal about things. People hate him. You love to hate this dude. And he doesn't care. He's going to keep doing what he has to do, keep grinding for his family. And every time that, like, when people make a decision, one of the things he always says is, uh, you got to do what's best for you and your family. I mean, I love that. You know, this man doesn't shy away from being a family man. You know, he's setting up Ronnie to, you know, to come in and, you know, be in the league and, you know, and, and do great things. Like, I mean, he, he loves his kid. He's having a blast with him and his wife, whatever, watching Bronny mm-hmm. up there, you know, playing and stuff. Like, I love that. Mm-hmm. So I think LeBron's legacy in L.A. will be – it's going to be a mixed bag. I think that people are going to hate him for being here because, you know, we didn't win that many titles. I'm sitting here thinking we won one in a league where they've grown to the part to where, you know, the three is, you know, that's what it is. You have to be able to shoot the three or you're not going to be able to compete. You know, Steph Curry mm-hmm. has changed the NBA forever everybody's popping threes now. No one's going to ever, no one's going to eclipse that record. I don't care what anybody says. Whatever he it retires with and finishes with the record, nobody's going to catch that. I just don't see that happening. But in a league where everybody is shooting threes, you're going to have to be able to contend with that. And not, and it's just not happening. Like that's why we keep getting beat. Everybody keeps hitting all these threes on us. But the fact that we were still able to go in and win one title when other people weren't able to come in to do it. People wouldn't come in to do it, you know, play with Kobe to do something like that or whatever. Braun came in. He brought people in. He had the mindset. He is a leader. They follow his lead and stuff like that. Like, I mean, he was able to win. I think his legacy is going to be, like I said, a mixed bag. Half the people are going to love what he did. The other half are just going to hate him because it's LeBron James. And that's just – they've hated him since he was in Ohio, you know, in mm-hmm. high school. And they're just always going to hate him. But for me personally, I, I'm forever grateful for him as a player, him as an activist, him as a human being. You know, I, I'm, I'm just so glad that he came to my team. I wanted him to join my team when he made the decision. But, hey, he went to Miami. That's fine. But I got, you know, I got to, I got to cheer for him. I didn't, you know, I didn't like LeBron in, in the beginning. I hated him. My buddy, uh, <laughs> one of my closest friends, is a major LeBron fan because he's from Ohio. And uh, he, he – he talked to LeBron James all the time. And that's why I, I didn't like him. Cause I'm like, whatever, man, he's not going to do stuff, but he's done so many <laughs> things. He's going to, you know, if, if he stays long enough, he's going to end up getting the point record. I think yep. that'll happen. And he'll do it in LA. I love mm-hmm. that. You know, I love the fact that he'll be able to do that in LA. He'll beat um, another Laker to do it. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, it's awesome to see that, you know, to see someone, to see someone that is great, to see greatness on the court um, is amazing. I know that people are going to hate, you know, his you know his time in LA that's just what it is but I'm not going to be one of those people man that's that's well awesome. said well mm-hmm. really well said yeah uh but just like we preach you know appreciate greatness while it's here you know giving their flowers and and I think looking back on a lot of these players you the, the numbers are astounding but like in the time that you're witnessing it you know, like a lot of people throw it to the side and mm-hmm. one of those people, I mean, like we've been pretty uh, st- stark defenders of, well, he's been playing like ass, uh, <laughs> is Westbrook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But triple doubles are nice. Uh, I know your man Carl Anthony Towns said he's going out and uh, chasing stats. <laughs> and Bede and Draymond Green has something to say to, to Cat. You know, Cat's still chasing the playoff game, so we you might want to calm that down a bit he's playing well this year but (laughs) the the idea that again you you can chase 
triple doubles, I, I didn't realize that, you know, I guess one triple double was worth more than another, you, you know, because mm. everyone questions Westbrook's uh, triple double, but not Harton or Luca, or mm-hmm. uh, in this case, Josh Giddy, who plays for a, a very bad team. It, mm-hmm. it takes effort to, to get these uh, triple doubles. If it was easy, you know, people would do it every night. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's my biggest problem with Westbrook. You know, people don't understand how hard he plays every night. The dude puts everything into it when he gets on that floor. He is like the definition of just all gas, no break. <laughs> I mean, it's just, he makes it – sometimes he makes it look effortless. You know, it's don't look past all his time. They're looking at, oh, Westbrook with the Lakers. Now, yeah, he's a little bit older, but you got to think all the teams that he did put on his back, even with Paul George and Melo being there, Westbrook was the guy. You know, when his MVP is doing all this, you got to respect that. And, you know, we know, we all know he can't shoot, but everything else, he's not too bad. He's not too shabby with it on the floor. And, you know, like you just said, you know, you're giving Josh Giddy the respect. I'm like, why? You know, he's on a shitty ass team. Come on, like, let's be real. Luca, he's inefficient as hell. Let, let's, let's, get it, let's get it going right now. He is inefficient. But, you know, oh, Luca, oh, man, MVP, MVP this, MVP that. James Harden, most of his points come at the line. I mean, sometimes he's he's really efficient, but most of the games he's inefficient. But he gets his triple doubles. Oh, James Harden, MVP, giving him his, his respect. But you go around the Western, Russell Westbrook and look what happens. Oh, no, look at this. He's, he's this, he's that. I'm like, listen, if you're going to talk about him, you're going to pretty much have that same energy for guys like Luca and just like James Harden. Same energy. And people yeah. aren't going to have it. Like, I'm, I'm here for mm-hmm. all of them, man. Like, I, mm-hmm. I don't care how you get your stats because it's still impressive that you do it. Because you exactly. still have to – you still have to play the game. You still – you yep. know, is, whether you get the points at the line, whether you get, you know, wh- whether you get your assist and everything, like it could be garbage. But it doesn't matter to me. You still have to do it. And so, mm-hmm. for people to be bent out of the shape that people are, st- you know, chasing stats, who cares? Like, if you can't do it, great. If you can do it, great. But either way, just shut the hell up and just play ball. You know, mm-hmm. like, that's one of those moments where you need to shut up and dribble. Like, like that right there, <laughs> shut the hell up and just dribble. Like, seriously. <laughs> like, either beat this man or just be quiet. Because mm-hmm. the reason why he's able to do it is because people can't, you know, like, you, you can't stop him. Because if he's still getting a triple-double or whatever, regardless of how it's happening, you're not able – you're not effectively able to shut him down. He may not be able to shoot, but he's still getting it. So chances mm-hmm. are you probably need to do something better to kind of shut him down altogether. And if you can't do that, mm-hmm. okay, just, you know, chalk it up to he was just better than me and then just move on. But, like, mm-hmm. Harden, yeah. Harden gets all this shit at the line. He still has to do it. I'm here for that, too. Exactly. I don't care. And like you said, Luca is ineffective. And something that pisses me off more than anything, that people love to shit on Russ so mm-hmm. much, mm-hmm. Um, that you start seeing disrespect with fans in games. That's mm-hmm. the thing that pisses me off. The yep. same people that are sitting there shitting on Russ are the same ones that are in the stands talking shit to the you know to the players. Like that's disrespectful. And fans really gotta like they really need to chill. We don't need another malice in the palace. Like I mean seriously, <laughs> like leave these players alone. They've been itching to punch you in the mouth like you know mm-hmm. for a long time. Like mm-hmm. like leave people alone, man. Like I mean Russ, he he comes in, he plays the game, he plays with heart. And, you know, and there's not anybody on this team that have negative things to say about him. So if mm-hmm. they're not saying anything negative about him, what the hell do you have to say negative about him? Like, move <laughs> on. Like, chill out. You, got, you know, like, I mean, it, it's it's just unnecessary. There's unnecessary drama there. And Cat, you know, he needs to shut his ass up. Just do what you got to <laughs> do. Do your part. Move on. But, like, <laughs> when you got Draymond, and Draymond, you know, like, he has no chill. He has no filter. When he comes out to defend you, that's that's big right there. Mm-hmm. That's a big thing right there. So when he's coming out and he's, you know, and, and being too, like it's just a matter of when these guys are defending you, you've earned the respect. You've earned your right to do whatever it is you want to do. The only options you have is either let him do it or shut him down. And that's it. He's just upset because, you know, he's not able to do whatever. He's not getting as much recognition. That's because Russ has just been doing it a lot longer. It is what it is. It's cool. You know, like, I mean, it's just, yeah, they're they doing too much. They really are. Way too much. Mm-hmm. And, uh, then, yeah. So, with this COVID situation, the uh, protocols, the 
now but they switch it to uh five days six days now uh but before yeah. it was 10 we had like a flurry of like 2015 players come back in the league just on 10-day <laughs> contracts it was it was wild uh, <laughs> isaiah thomas lance stevenson mario chalmers brandon knight james ennis <laughs> Lanston Galloway, like God, it was 2011. Like yeah, Joe. Aaron Johnson. Collison came out of retirement, man. Yeah. In the <laughs> he didn't know what the hell to do. He 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 didn't even think the rules changed. I remember he did something. They're like, you know, you know that was ten years ago, right? The rules are completely different. He's looking around. He's like, like, what the hell is going on? What did I come back into? Uh, that was great. <laughs> yeah, he should have came back in 2020 when we were trying to get him. He should have came back uh, that year. And everything uh, would have been fine. Nah, man. It's two years <laughs> past, man. Shit is different. <laughs> oh, man. Like, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, because like, all these 10 day contracts, uh, are you surprised at, at some people who are not back in the league? Any names you could, you might be able to think of? Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't know. Because, like, Lance Stevenson got back in. The fact that Lance, you know, <laughs> uh, was gone as long as he was to begin with, or whatever. It's kind of mind boggling. I mean, yeah, Same. like he he loved Irk and LeBron James, and they finally got the. That's another thing. LeBron was like, okay, you were my enemy. Now you're on my team. So now you can't do this anymore. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> uh, so the fact that Lance got back in or whatever, that was pretty cool. I am really surprised. I, I'm more impressed than surprised that J.R. Smith hasn't come back. You know, he did when he went back to college. He's mm -hmm. playing golf. Like, I love that. Like, that's an awesome story. You know, hopefully he's mm -hmm. not doing Hennessy in between holes and shit. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, he's, <laughs> uh, but to see that he didn't actually come back or whatever was a little bit of a shock. But, you know, I, I'm kind of, you know, I am happy about that one. And I can't really think of, like, you know, specific names, you know. But I, I'm sure if I had to think about it, there, you know, it could be some, like, like Joakim Noah, he retired a bull, didn't he? Like, he, he just, you know, came yeah, back and yeah. retired. I mean, yeah. hell, you know, with all that stuff, whatever, maybe him coming back would have been pretty cool. I mean, he, you know, I mean, he just would have been on the bench, you know, like a paperweight or something. But still, you know, just to have some of these guys that were, you know, thinking, okay, I think I'm done, you know, but COVID kind of shortened it, you know. Um, oh, man, my boy. Damn it. Oh. The guy that he played in the G League for the Lakers forever, and then he cracked the league and, you know, had a major game, and then he. Oh, you know, I know you're talking game. about. Oh, my God. He was. Uh, he I was should know this. He's a late, he was a Laker. But, he was um, the shooting guard. Oh my God, he he was an no, older he, guy too. It, it, he was like thirty something when he came in the league. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh my God, yeah, see the hairline and everything. But him, <laughs> man, he should have came back. That that would have been. You know, some of the <laughs> some of the Lakers that we you know that we had. So like Lou Old Dang, I'm I'm pretty sure we still owe him money. Get your ass still back. Still paying him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's still paying him like a Bobby Bonilla contract, man. Uh, no, Bernie Williams. Uh, but yeah, like I was just. Uh, oh man, yeah, was it Andre yeah. Ingram? Was that his name? Yes. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I think it's Andre Ingram. Yeah. Andre should have came back. Sacre should have came back. Uh, <laughs> all these Lakers yeah, that we had Robert in the past. Sacre. Bring Kwame Brown back. You know, just – Wow, Dave Brown. Oh, man. <laughs> cool. Oh, hell. Uh, put uh, Javaris Crittenton on parole. Let him come <laughs> back, play 10 days, and send his ass back to jail. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Work release. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Like the replacements. Oh, oh man, man, that would be funny. Carlos Boozer. I mean, you got, yeah. man, you got oh, a shitload Boozer. of guys that came back. Good yeah. Lord. Oh. Nick Young, where he at? <laughs> yeah. Swaggy P, I thought he was coming back in 2020. Nope. I, nope. Bring him back. Bring back Garrett and Matt Barnes on the same team and see how oh, that oh, so, goes. Nah, somebody getting shot. Somebody getting killed. Oh, it, it, ain't, yeah. it ain't got it. It ain't in the no other way. You got him, Kwame Brown, Derek Fisher. It, it's a fight. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Bring back Gilbert Arenas. Yes, bring oh, them all back. That man. hey, Gilbert Arenas. That been a man. Spot. Oh man, that would have been Showtime for all the wrong reasons. Oh, or Knox, right? The BA edition. <laughs> oh man. Oh, that was good. Yeah, <laughs> good question though. Ah oh, man, so. You know, Rondo's been traded to Cleveland. Part of the Knicks uh, got in on a three-way deal. Denzel Valentine. Uh, we hardly knew you. <laughs> <laughs> Big bomb. <laughs> right. Seriously. It, it, you know, it was funny. Is we, we had uh, Rev, uh, Robert on, 
uh, a while ago, and, and uh, he, he was great. Uh, mm-hmm. We got to talk about uh, the seventies and all the players he we reminisced about. I think that, that was the week we covered the seventies, and I mm-hmm. uh, was going over the old Chicago Bulls, and I mean he had nothing but glowing things to say about Denzel Valentine. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. I, no, I, I honestly, that's that's the kind of the wrong stories that I happen to get at work. That just throw it kind of threw my day. I'm like, I look at it. It's that, what the, that motherfucking Chuck. That's what I said. I'm glad nobody can hear me in my office. That's exactly what I said about this motherfucking Chuck here. He take one goddamn out of pocket shot. Tis better get his ass out that damn arena. But um, I'm just, I kind of knew they were going to release him anyway. So it's it was whatever. It was kind of like the KP trade. I think you were the one that told me. I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, what? What is going on? I, I mean, I still call him Charmin to this day, but that, that shit yeah. kind of hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Rondo going to Cleveland to take Rubio's spot, who unfortunately went down for the season. But, but the Knicks getting Valentine, it, that's, that's not the story. Kemba Walker hurt. Derrick Rose hurt. Looks like they're in, again, Searching for a point guard. <laughs> what are <they> looking at? <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, there's a lot of talk. I don't know, you free John Wall or bring in Malcolm Brogdon, De'Aaron Fox. Wish... Any of these names might be uh, uh, feasible to you. Darren Fox would be interesting, but then, of course, you're giving up Obi. You got to give up first round picks. Um, the two I really, of course, I'm going to say my God, Dean, but I, I know that ain't happening. That back and forth, that ain't ever going in. But it's, it's a name that really I've been looking into, DeJounte Murray, because I really think they can peel that kid away from him. And he, great defensively. His offensive game is starting to pick up. I would not mind him on the team. Um, if you want to take the veteran route, like we talked about in the chat, like John Wall, but that 44 and 47 million, that just ain't happening because those, those, those salaries ain't going to match. So that's a no go. Um, honestly, that's, it's not much. You, you have to go to trade route. It's not like you can pick somebody or you can stay the course, like quickly see what he can do. Let him run the team, see what he can do. Um, you got Grimes, you got McBride, you got guys that can probably run the offense or let Alex Burks run it. But I think they're going to – if you want to make that playoff push, you're going to have to make a trade. You're going to have to pull a Nets. And, and you got to go big. But I don't know. I really don't – I don't think they're going to part with their draft picks. They've been – they've been non-nicking it. Let me just say that. They have been yeah. really reluctant to, try, like, add picks or make moves that's not going to help the team. And – as of right now, I wouldn't be mad if they just stayed a course. I mean, give us a Miles Turner or something like that or some bonus for Mitch Robson. Absolutely, I'm going to take it. But as of right now, I can't see a be a move being made, especially with these protocols, just safety protocols happening. You might trade for a player. He might go into safety protocols, and then it's just going to get ugly. So just just stay the course if, if you're going to do that. I mean, Tibbs is like he's about to have a heart attack on the damn sidelines most games. I mean <laughs> – would it's looking you, terrible. Would you take Westbrook? Yeah, I would. Why not? I mean, he's he's usually – he's good with the young team. I could say he's good with the young team because he can be that guy. Like, because obviously in L.A., he's not the guy. So I think he's still adjusting to that. It's really hard to go from, you know, being a top dog to you have to be that second or third wheel. Look at Carmelo. And I think that really – that took a while for him. And when he first – he went to OKC, We I think we all remember that. But what about you playing the bench? Hey, yo, hi. He said, yo, I'm going to play on the bench. He was dead serious. Melo was like an alpha dog on the floor. Right? You a freaking 13, 14-time All-Star, scoring champion, MVP candidate in some years, and you got to go to the bench? That That's rough, man. <laughs> that's yeah. – shit. Even street ball, I hated freaking having a stop or freaking play on a bench, man. I, shit, I could imagine being a pro and oh, sit on the bench. Excuse me? But Westbrook, I actually would take. It, it wouldn't hurt. Like, any kind of move, I don't think it would really hurt the team. Who are you going to give up? Kevin Knox? Like, 
plays like two minutes. Who the hell cares? Kevin Knox, I mean, give up a first round pick and then give Dallas and see what else is out there. But don't, you know, the OBs and stuff like that. I don't, it depends who it is. It all depends who's in that deal. If it's a game changing or a franchise changing point guard that we can use for the next 10 years, then you would have to do it because we had so much trouble getting that guy. Shit, when the last time we had a, shit, can I say, well, I will say Rose. I was about to go Felton, but Rose has been really good and he's been healthy. And with Kimba, you know, one good knees make up two, but that doesn't work for players. So <laughs> it kind of it's kind of rough right now. But he's not going to be back for what six weeks, and then Kemba's knee is going to be barking all year. This was another thing. You got to have that backup because you can't play him 40, 45 I minutes. Mean, it ain't going to happen. He's going to last about three weeks, and then we're going to be in a predicament all over again. So I think they're scouring the trade market. I like the fact that they keep things tight-lipped and we don't know. Like, you know, years ago when the Knicks were in everything, you knew everything. I like keep it tight-lipped. If it happens, then it comes out. But I like what Leon Rose and World Wide West is actually doing. But it's looking bad right now. But it's early. A lot of teams, Hawks, Lakers. Lakers, I still think is they're going to be middle of the pack. Everybody gets back. I cannot see them not going to the playoffs. The Knicks, I, I gave them AFC last year. Seven to AC, best best case scenario. That's what I thought. Hey, we got the fifth, we got the fourth. I'll take that. Yeah, absolutely. We overachieved. You damn right. I was happy as hell. You damn right. Next tape was back. God damn, we bang bing bonging it everywhere. But um, as of right now, it's early. I'm not nervous yet. You know, give me two, three more weeks. Get back to me. See what happens. But as of right now, we got the Hawks playing crappy. The Hornets. You got so many teams underperforming right now. It's we're just. We're treading water, and you know I hate that freaking turn. <laughs> Can't stand it. <laughs> I mean, that's the best thing to do in the COVID era, though. You know, just kind of yeah. sit there and just kind of watch everybody else kind of just mm-hmm. fall to the wayside or whatever and just start making your way up, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, hopefully the Lakers actually get that fucking memo. But I don't see that happening. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see it happening. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I really do like that Fox and, and Murray. I really like that Murray uh, – idea. That's what I, said. I like Murray. Like, I know I got to go to James. I mean, Westbrook. It depends. If you give up, listen, if you give up absolutely like nothing for him, and it's just he's just like, of course you're going to say would I like to see McBride? Absolutely. You know why? Because I'm more about giving the young guys chances. But you got to start thinking about who else you can use. Who else is out there? Go. You got to go to the G League like, or you can get Burks back in there. But you, I would let quickly run it. And then McBride, you know, see what he – you got to see what these young players have right now. This is the perfect time. We are not going anywhere yet. But let these guys – this is what we mean when we talk about player development. These are the times that you do it. You know, we're not a top team. You're not really going to lose much. They get enough time to play, see what they have. Deuce, he can play defense. He has a nice three-point shot. Grimes, 3 and D player. Give these guys some chances. Like I said, I wouldn't be all – if you don't get Westbrook, would I be mad? No. But IQ, we got three-point guys that's more than able. So if they're going to run with that, I will be happy. It just goes away from the rhetoric that the Knicks don't care about player development, which has been that way for years. So if you're going to start, do it now. Yeah, and, and the idea of holding on to young guys for, uh, I guess, for the right person sometimes can mm-hmm. backfire as well. I mean, look Good at the Lakers with, you know, Quentin Tucker. They failed to trade him for Lowry. They, mm. they failed to trade him again uh, this offseason. And now he's, his trade value is at an absolute low. So there are times when you have to pull the trigger. I'm not saying you're giving up RJ and Obi, mm. but if you're looking towards the future, uh, a younger point guard like a Murray, or if you're on the cusp of, you know, top three, top four, you can ask him free agents if Westbrook can attract a free agent to New York because he does have that star power. You know, it, it would be something to consider. It, you know, I know RJ's a top well, five three. pick and yeah, yeah. top three. And, mm-hmm. and, and Obi showing some flashes. We'll see what he, uh, what he shows now with more time on the floor. But, you know, holding on to young guys, just, it could be just as detrimental as mm-hmm. trading for old guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to look at Oklahoma City. They have 
387 <laughs> first round draft picks. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there like, what the fuck are you going to do with all of those? And like, you know, just kind of holding on to them, but they keep trading players and getting more draft picks. And yeah. we're all just sitting there like, okay, at some point you're going to do something, right? Yeah. And we're just sitting there kind of still waiting for whatever it is they're going to do. And they're not really doing much with it. So it's just like, what the whole point? Is? Like, are you just like collecting them because you have a collection? No, this is, you know, this is my gun collection. This is my hat collection. <laughs> this is my draft pick collection. What the fuck are you going to do with those? Do something with it. You know, it's just like after a certain point, it's not baseball. You know, baseball, you stop, you know, you stockpile these up because you're going to make this blockbuster deal and you get this, mm-hmm. you know, franchise player, like, you know, life-changing player and everything like that. With the league, it's not, I don't know. It just doesn't work that way. So sitting mm-hmm. here and watching Oklahoma City with all these, it's like, okay, something needs to happen. I do agree that, you know, with the younger players, they're going to circle back around to some of these teams. So, you know, mm-hmm. you know, giving up on the quote unquote, get it, giving up on them now is not necessarily going to be that bad, you know, the thing, because some of them are going to journey around to other teams and eventually find their fit or whatever. It's just going to take a while. But if you don't pull the trigger on some of them now, you're sitting here thinking that, you know, okay, uh, especially for teams like the Knicks, they haven't won a championship in forever, you know, you're at a point to where it's like you need to make some decisions now because next year it could just be like you said last year you guys were you know near the top of the seating in the playoffs mm-hmm. and this year you know you don't know you know it's, it could be hit or miss your window closes pretty quickly for teams like mm-hmm. this you got to take a chance otherwise it's just going to be like okay what if and that's just you know it at this point a lot of teams need to be considering that Get rid of some of this young talent to try to, you know, uh, put some of these old, you know, these veterans together and see if they can gel together and see if you can do a playoff run. I mean, that's what you really need to do because you're not beating the Golden State Warriors and the Phoenix Suns and the Bucks and stuff like that. You got to think of something outside of the box to try to contend. Otherwise, you just need to tank the season and just try to get, you know, uh, you know, or be Oklahoma City and just 92, you know, draft picks, <laughs> you know, per year and just don't do shit with it. You know, I, you got to do something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I, I still, I'm still on the belief that Oklahoma City is going to cash out those picks for some oh, stars or something. I still think absolutely. it's Ben Simmons, but at this point, two, three years down the road, they got to, they have to cash out on on, on these picks because mm-hmm. it, it, it's pointless to to hold like 55 to 70 picks. It's useless. But on on the same token, like you mentioned, Brooklyn, they they cashed out their guys. For Harden, and we will finally see scary <laughs> owls in effect uh, this coming Wednesday as Kyrie returns against Indiana, only playing road games due to the <laughs> vaccine mandate here in the city. But you know, <sighs> road act. Yeah, I mean, Karis LeVert, you knew was a star, mm-hmm. uh, albeit injury prone. Jared Allen, everybody knew he was going to be a hundred million dollar man. Look what he's doing out in Cleveland, and they, they traded. Obviously, all of their picks, but in a pursuit of a championship, these are risks you're going to have to make. Um, but finally, uh, I'm glad to see uh, Harden looking like himself over this past two weeks. Uh, the time off of protocols really did him some good. Um, Durant was playing at an MVP level beforehand. You know, he, he's coming back into the fold, and I'm, I'm sure Kyrie and these guys – all the chemistry are going to come in, just hit the ground running, and mm-hmm. really get off these past couple of games where they look uh, lackluster and taking their opponents for granted. I mean, they lost to a Clipper team where they were up by 13 in the fourth quarter, and no Marcus Morris and Eric Bledsoe led a 10 nothing run in the fourth quarter. Eric Bledsoe and uh, the Clippers, <laughs> Clippers took it home in Brooklyn, and Durant got on the team afterwards saying they lacked effort and lacked focus against uh, and took an opponent for granted, which what the leader does. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm excited to see how this finally plays out in Brooklyn and, uh, you know, I'll bring a championship home. But, um, but yeah, cashing in on, on, on those young stars and draft picks is more often than not the way to go, but, you know, time will tell. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about some young stars, those guys out in Houston, uh, Kevin Porter Jr., Christian Wood, uh, you know, my man John Lucas, uh, young, uh, been around the game for a while, coaching these young guys up, Porter threw some, uh, 
threw an object in the locker room, Wood refused to go back in the game, and my man pulled up, pulled in, uh, and Antonio Brown just left the arena. <sighs> Young Houston team, Steven Silas, uh, son of Paul Silas, expected hard in Westbrook, got this young crew. Uh, they had a little hot streak when Jalen Green and Porter were out. Uh, but now they seem to come back down to earth. Uh, what do you make of this locker room incident? You want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, Leon and I talked about it a little bit earlier because, you know, I kind of mentioned it. Um, they have to – everybody, everybody, you know, in that organization – has to tread carefully on what they do next mm -hmm. because what they do next as an organization will set the precedence precedence for every other franchise every other league every other team in the league will watch what they do and how they handle it and how they handle these young players or how the players are handled will set the tone for everything else because you have to look at it from both ways they did what they did for a reason. It could be one or two things. It could be more than two, but let's just use a binary, you know, example here. The coaches said something that really pissed them off that was highly disrespectful or, you know, didn't show like they actually trusted or cared about their players and the players just like, fuck it, I'm done. Or the players are throwing temper tantrums because they're not being, you know, because the coaches are actually coaching them and wanted to do things a certain way. And they're just like, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. How they respond to this is going to determine how the rest of the league is going to be with their players going forward in the future. This is definitely um, a guinea pig experiment to see what's going to happen next. Because mm -hmm. we, can, we can sit there and talk about, you know, A.B. and how he just kind of took off his, you know, his, his jersey, you know, and waved or whatever. That's what he does. And, you know, yes, there's something. There's some CTE type shit going on with A.B., you know, there. There, there could be some other things. There's speculation that they didn't want him to play because if he, you know, got uh, any more completions, they would owe him a little bit more money. They didn't want to do that. You know, he's already lied and all this other stuff. It, it could be just, you know, some things that were just disrespectful. There's a lot of stuff going on there. So you can say that about him. That's fine. But with these young kids or whatever, them leaving and stuff, you don't know. I, I think it's just one of those things where it's like if we – if if we sweep it under the rug, it's just like, okay, if it's just one incident, it's isolated. That might just be a Band-Aid on something, but they need – something needs to happen. They really do need to talk to – you know, need to talk to their players um, as a whole and just say, look, you, you're, letting, you're letting us down. You, you know, you're letting the team down. You're letting the fans down, the people that invest money into this team. That's what I was telling Leon. Like, there's people that are spending a lot of money, you know, to watch these guys play, and they don't get to see them play because, they, you know, because they can't get their shit together. Um, mm -hmm. that's frustrating. As a fan, if that happened with my team and, you know, I'm expecting, you know, this dude to come out and be a monster and, the, you know, the coaches and players can't get it right and dude to say, you know, I'm not going to play anymore, I would be frustrated trying to get my money back. You know, Leon mm -hmm. was telling me that because one of his guys, you know, decided not to play. He lost <laughs> – he lost in fantasy <laughs> that week. That's frustrating, man. He lost by a couple of points or a point or two. Like, that's extremely frustrating. Like, to, to sit there and be that close and then that shit happens, in a league where you have money on the line, like seriously, like that, that stuff is frustrating. They got to mm -hmm. get it together and they need to make sure that they do it the right way, that they take the time and, you know, think it out and figure out exactly how to handle it. Otherwise, again, you're going to see other, you already got Ben Simmons here. Who's not playing, you know, personal reason, injury, yada, yada, all this other stuff doesn't want to play. It's already been like that, but now people are doing it mid game. And that's, the, that's dangerous. That's dangerous mm -hmm. to, to other teams that are trying to make a push, other teams that are trying to, you know, make an impact and stuff like that. They, you know, like, they could be trying to force the hand, trying to get out of, the, you know, out of, out of the team. You know, well, I don't know. I really don't know. But they really need to tread carefully on this one because it's definitely going to, you know, it's going to set a tone for the rest of the league. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because what I was saying, what, this is about the era of player empowerment. And, this may, <clears throat> these course of action may take that pendulum and swing it back towards the owners a bit. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Like you said, we're seeing with Ben Simmons and he's, he's been fined $10 million now uh, throughout the course of the season. Uh, I, I won't say the Kyrie Nets thing. That's a, that's a, 
whole, totally different uh, mm. story. But Goran Dragic. So story with that traded to Toronto. Never reported. Yeah. Finally, finally did report. Said he's going to take some personal time off. Find him down in Miami, attending the Miami game. He wants to play again for Miami or gets bought out to Dallas. But uh, the way Toronto front office looking, that they're not really looking to appease him. But as far as his Houston situation is concerned, yes, it would be nice to know the rest of his story. Like he said, uh, whether it was something the coach has said to make him snap or just complete and utter unprofessionalism from the players. Player empowerment can only go so far. And you know what? These owners are signing the checks. These fans are putting putting money in your pocket by buying jerseys, uh, concessions. There's a certain level of respect and uh, an, an expectation for you to approach your job professionally. And I think also a lack of presence from the veteran players on on this team, much less John Wall, who in his own right wants out. But, you know, and that story in itself is kind of weird. You know, we mm-hmm. got into it before, but, you know, Eric Gordon's, the John Walls, who are there for veteran presence, but kind of like, you know, I, I can't sit here and babysit as well as, you know, play a game because that's not part mm-hmm. of my job description. It, it, it's asking a lot. And, uh, yeah, it, it would be very interesting to see where this goes. I, I know they were each suspended one game tonight. And uh, we'll see how it plays out in the future. Yeah, that's, that's wild, man. It just, and I know KPJ, he has a history of it. And I'm like, dude, don't don't get that rap that you're going to do something like that. You already have the rap that you're like a loose cannon. Mm-hmm. So it's making yourself look bad, you know. And John Lucas, yeah, he seems like he's an old school kind of coach. But he wants the kids to learn. And sometimes you just, you got to shut up and listen. That's the number one thing. Don't play your card. You know, don't show your hand, especially on the floor, stuff like that. When you get in the locker room, you know, go in his office, coach. Okay, let's talk about it. But doing that, you're, you're showing up your coach, you know, you're making the whole team just look like a bunch of just immature kids. And it's, and you go back to John Wall, Eric Gordon, they should be the guy saying something about it. You've been around the league with John Wall. We, he had an attitude problem too. You know, he was that, you know, he was that guy at the ad. So I'm John Wall coming out of Kentucky. I was the big dog on campus. But he's old enough to understand, like, listen, come on, kid, you can't be doing this. Well, there's something was said, but like you just said, there has to be more to this. And maybe stuff was said to him. He just didn't want to listen. But it's going to be interesting. It's going to come out sooner or later. So this is going to be really interesting to find out exactly what happened. Right. Yeah, I, I wonder if this propels them to make wood uh, a trade uh, trade candidate. So I thought he was on the fringe a bit, mm-hmm. but I wonder if this incident would like really push that forward because Wood would be an interesting play for a lot of teams. Oh yeah, a lot of contending Absolutely. teams. Uh, mm-hmm. Agile big man who can shoot. I mean, you know, he goes to Golden State or he goes to uh, you know, the Lakers. Really, really can impact a lot of teams. So. I, I wonder if he's uh, on the block. I, after this, man, it's hard to not see that. Actually, though. right? Uh-uh. You can't have. I this. definitely think. Yeah, I think he's there. It's just a matter of let's just see how after the suspension goes. Let's see how mm-hmm. they act during it. Um, mm-hmm. It's a yeah, because that'll that'll also be a tell right there. But uh, I definitely think the next game that they're in, you know, their actions will kind of determine it. If they they play the card like okay. Um, you're doing this, I'm going to call you a bluff. You, you're going to suspend me. Mm-hmm. Let's see how long you do decide to do that. to see if they can try to, you know, get themselves traded out of the, you know, out of Houston. And yep. it's just, it's frustrating. Again, um, like you said, player empowerment only goes so far. You know I mean? After a certain point, it's just like, you know, like we get it. You don't want to play here. You don't want to do something like that. You're hurting your own brand. You're hurting, you know, mm-hmm. you're hurting your fans. You're hurting all this other stuff, whatever. Um, you become less likable. And that's, you know, you don't have to do it to, to be like this stuff, but it's just like it only works for certain people because, mm-hmm. you know, agents could try to, you know, get their players pushed out of teams and stuff like that all the time, whatever, but it could backfire. And that's where it's just like, then what are you going to do? 
it's like the Ben Simmons things. Like, okay, you're not going to play. And then it was like, okay, well, maybe he will play because now he's going broke kind of thing, whatever. It's just like after a certain point, you can only do this for so long before someone actually, you know, just like we're not going to put, you know, we're not going to give you what you want. You're either going to play or you're just going to sit out or whatever. And it's just – it's a waste. Like this is the game that you you played as a kid. You remember you, you spent so many hours a night, you know, playing with that, you know, rigged up basketball hoop in, in front of your garage shooting day after day, you know, you're doing what so many people, like people like me, wish I could have did, you know, kind of thing, whatever. And now you're just like, fuck it, I don't want to play. I'm just going to do whatever it is I want to do. Like, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. You got to do what you got to do. But those kids that, you know, idolize you and stuff like that, they see what you're doing, you're breaking their hearts, man. You know, after a certain point, you know, you do have to remember who you're playing for. I'm not saying that you're, lo- you have to have loyalty to anybody by any means, especially not the governors. But like, remember these kids remember these kids who are watching you and enjoy you and stuff like that like i mean it's just like you're seeing your superhero um decides like fuck it, i'm not gonna save the world kind of thing you know it's just it's frustrating um and it, and it can get frustrating especially with these young kids like i mean this is just figure out what's going on serve your suspension talk to your players like man up figure out what you need to do to to do whatever needs to do and, and then just do it Otherwise, it's just like, you know, literally, you're just wasting time, whatever. And it's just, it's just going to frustrate everybody. Everybody involved is going to be frustrated. Get mm-hmm. past it. And let's just, you know, let's just go on and, you know, have some better place about playing ball. Yeah, man. It's, that's what it's all about, man. Just playing ball. Yeah, you know, we do this growing up as kids. Now we just made money for it. And I guess a lot of emotions get in the way and a lot of expectations. And also, I, I, I get that aspect of it. But yeah, it's it, it, it's disheartening to watch uh, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, John Morant been playing like out of his mind lately. Uh, I think hopefully he will make his first All Star game this year because you know he uh, truly deserves it. But you know, big time players for a small market team, I I think sometimes can go underappreciated, even in their own market. And uh, remember the Grizzlies were on a 12-game winning streak and then Morant came back and they lost like two or three in a row uh, before his 40-point outburst the past couple games. And I guess the fans said it would better with him sitting out when in last year we were chanting MVP. So it, it's, you know, just fans more or less being fickle. You know, what what have you done for me lately type deal. Mm. Uh, but... I don't think it goes unnoticed when it's time to make a decision in free agency uh, for the most part when, when these, they try to keep these small, uh, when these small market teams try to keep their guy. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the um, Julius Randle thing. Like I said, I'll get mad at him, but I'm not going to forget that the dude was uh, the most important part of our team. Most improved player for a reason. The dude killed it on the floor. Um, you know, you don't forget stuff like that. You got to, all players go through tough times. I don't, you know, most players go through tough times. You know, he's not not MJ. You know, he's not the Dirks or KGs. Those guys are just generational talents. But, you know, he's going to let them fight through it. We'll see what he does after that. But, yeah, John Moran to say, oh, yeah, oh, John Moran, oh, yeah, we were better without him. Yeah, okay, let's not forget when you drafted the guy, he pretty much put life back into that whole grit and grind thing and made your team relevant. But people with short memories, short-term memories, uh, some fans have, but. That's how it goes sometimes. Fans are fickle as hell, man. Like, mm-hmm. and that's extremely frustrating because you go from, you know, like, I mean, look at my look at my fan base. Lakers, they you know they they hated when LeBron got there. They hated mm-hmm. that first year. They loved him and AD and all that stuff. That second year when we got the championship, didn't do stuff last year, and they're pissed off again. It's just like, man, we literally just won a championship within the last three seasons. Like, I mean, we played two seasons in w- within one year and won a championship in one of them. Like, y'all get bent out of shape out of the craziest things. Mm-hmm. The small market teams are really frustrating. That's why, like, me, the thing that pisses me off more than anything is when these small market teams give these lifetime contracts, like these crazy deals to players that they know are going to walk or end up somewhere else. You, you know, like, I mean, it's just like, you're doing that, and obviously you're doing it because you want a player to stay, but you're not going to be able to build a team around them. 
you literally just sunk your team. Like John Wall getting all that money. They didn't really do much of nothing. Now he's gone. Now nobody's going to be able to trade on those, you know, contracts and stuff like that because it's, you know, I mean, this is it's too much money. You know, Dame mm-hmm. Will, like his contract and stuff like that, like, you know, paid him a lot of money to stay and didn't build a team around him. Like, look at Milwaukee. They actually did a decent job getting good players around Giannis and they won a championship the next season. That's kind of what you're wanting to do. But if you're yep. just sitting there and you have the same players, and you're not willing to do what you got to do, it's not going to go anywhere. But the fans to get mad at the ones like John ja Morant and, you know, and, and, and Dame and, and these players like that who are actually doing a damn good job, they piss me off more than anything. These are the, you know, the casual fans who are just like, oh, we're not winning. Oh, it's because of this person. Really? Y'all are a better team without John ja Morant? That's fine. Yeah, I kind of felt <laughs> the same way with Giannis in 2020 when – they won those games against um, Miami or whatever when Giannis was hurt. They didn't win one, you know, much when he was playing. They were actually winning the games when he wasn't on the court. And it's just like, mm-hmm. that's not fair. You know, to sit there and make it seem like, oh, it's good. No, it's just a matter of sometimes teams click better because they know they have to give their all more because their star is out. That's why they, you know, they're able to get some of these games. Mm-hmm. Sit there and just make it seem like, you know, John, like literally this dude just, you know, won a rookie of the year a couple of years ago. Um, you know, he like he's balling out of his mind, and for people to sit there, you know, and shit on this man, like it makes absolutely no sense. Like, I, like I said, fans get on my goddamn nerves. My fans <laughs> get on my nerves so much. Like, it's just it's so frustrating. Like, you know, you can't whoop these guys. You can't beat them on the court yourselves, or whatever. So stop acting like you could do the job better. Just enjoy the team mm-hmm. that you have, and mm-hmm. you know, just hope to God that they, you know, they'll be able to do something. You know, um do something in the year that you're playing. Otherwise, you know, just, just shut up. Like, seriously. <laughs> John Morant is the reason why they're succeeding right now. That's why they're in position to succeed. Don't try to pin, the, you know, the failures of the team on him. That's stupid. Yeah, it, it, it's just wild. And, you know, fans are like that in every sport. It, it, it's just yeah. the way it goes. And, you know, for the most part, you know, we try to be above it. But to try to block out that noise, it's very, very frustrating. Yeah. Um, big LA fan. Uh, I I know she won a championship out in Chicago. Uh, with Candace Parker named the female athlete of the year. So shout out to her. And uh, uh, shout out to Becky Hammond. Mm-hmm. To finally be Las Vegas Aces coach and GM. Uh, Five year deal making awesome. her the highest paid. Mm-hmm. Uh, WNBA coach in history, uh, taking over Aces and Bill Lambeer, uh, power wow. position, rumored for a long time to be an NBA coach. Uh, I know we spoke about it uh, last week, whether she would uh, take a WNBA job or keep fighting for an NBA one. Looks like that decision has been made, you know, at total, total power play. And, you know, someone of her stature who uh, played as long as she did in the league and and build up a resume in the NBA. I'm, it's uh, refreshing to see. Absolutely. She she even said it. You know, she feels glad that, that she has her own team. Now you get to build it any way you want, but you shouldn't have to with, you know, Embaj and freaking <laughs> Asha Wilson and, you know, all that talent they have on the team. And you can't – she's already set up to win a championship already in her first year, the way mm-hmm. things are going. Um. Kelsey Plum, my girl Kelsey Plum, like that's talent everywhere, man. It's damn good for her. I'm happy for her, man. She definitely deserves it. It's her time to do it. Yeah, it, it's it's cool to see. Um, it, uh, now, in the past, you know, two three years, we've seen uh, females in high ranking positions, you know, owners and GMs and uh, coaches a- along the sports landscape. And it's something that, I guess, obviously a few years ago, would have never thought would happen. Mm-hmm. And they, these females are making sound decisions. Look at the Marlins uh, over with uh, baseball, MLB. And I know Vince McIntyre, Henry Maldonado Jr. of Dong City. Once we get some baseball action, they'll, they'll be right back on it. But uh, both guys do an awesome job. But, you know, uh, Ray Montgomery, Atlanta Dream owner, GM as well. It, it's just refreshing to see uh, 
uh, each these ladies in in power positions. Absolutely, I gotta say that I am really appreciative of uh, what Basketball Life does by you know honoring and embracing women and the killer job they do. Like, I mean. I'm still not like a big time fan of the, when I say I'm not a big, like I don't follow the right. WNBA mm-hmm. as much as I mm-hmm. should, but I got two daughters. I got a seven year old and a three year old. And um, we sat down and watched the game in 2020, the first, um, first game of the season, you know, they started in the bubble and stuff like that. And I sat down with, with my daughter. I was like, look, I want you to see this. This league started when I was in seventh grade and they started out with like eight teams and they have like they they've grown and grown, and these are professional. These are like the best of the best playing in you know in this league, and they get you know an opportunity to play the games they love and stuff like that. She wasn't into it as much as I was. Like she liked it for a while, and then her attention span was just like I'm gonna go do something else. But just being able to sit my daughter down and show her like look, these are women that are like killing it and everything like that. So you know you you go to Becky and see you know. I was sitting here, I was talking with, you know, I worked at a Boys and Girls Club this past summer, and I was telling, the, you know, the, the boys in my group was like, look, keep an eye out for this name here. She's going to be a coach in the NBA one day. She's going to be a head coach in the NBA one day. Just wait. And I was rooting for her. And at first, when I saw that she took, you know, the ace's job, I was like, oh, man, it's kind of a letdown because now she's coaching women's sport. And I had to shut, I had to stop myself right there. That's not a letdown because she's still – an amazing person, an amazing coach. And she has a great opportunity to be able to coach this team. And she gets to be a GM. She gets to set the tone. Like she has built herself up so much so that she was being considered for a job in both leagues at the same time, simultaneously having an opportunity to be considered for both sides. That's incredible. That means, you know, you're doing one hell of a job for you to be considered in either of them, but both of them, in the same, like within the same, like you know, time sp- time span or whatever, that that's really good. Like I'm, I'm happy for. Her. I think that'd be great. Do I think one day she might be able to, you know, parlay that one time, you know, like and, and push it into an NBA job? Maybe I would love that. I still want to see, um, see a woman be a head coach in the NBA. We have uh, women referees and everything. I, I think it's, um, I think it's great. It's great for the league to have diversity, to have inclusion, to do these things, and to not be afraid of. So many times the reason why we don't do these things is because of fear. What will happen if this and this and that? If the person knows their shit, it doesn't matter whether or not they played in the actual league that, you know, that you played in. If they know what they're doing, let them mm-hmm. do it. That's how it should be. I mean, hell, like, I mean, to see um, the person in the front office in Miami, you know, kind of, you know, move up the ranks, that's great. That's an awesome story because they know what they're doing. And that's how it should be. But we just kind of turn it because, oh, they never played the game. Like, there's still so many chauvinistic people. Like, you know, and you see it sometimes in some of these groups. I'm not an admin in these groups. So I can just say it. Like, in baseball <laughs> life, like, you start talking about women doing stuff. And it's just like, anytime you mention something with inclusion, you see these random motherfuckers who never post, ever, come out of nowhere. And they just start typing these poorly misspelled um, <laughs> defenses of why everything is fine the way it is. And, like, no, it's not. When you start including other people who love and appreciate the game as well, that just may be slightly different than what the norm is, that's when you know the game is getting better. That's when you know it's evolving. So, yeah, kudos to Becky for being able to land this job because it's amazing. Um, women are doing amazing things, and it's about time that we start recognizing them for the killer shit that they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, agreed. And, you know, I- I'm glad you told that. Um, story about watching the game with your daughters because that's also what makes that's, that's also why we do it you know I have a daughter myself I have niece, a bunch of nieces uh, I know uh, Jacob you have some nieces and a lot of people in our group have daughters and nieces mm-hmm. and so on and so forth so you know I feel it's I, I wouldn't say an obligation like a, a duty to show like you know what yeah see these women can do the same exact thing as you know, the men can and, you know, put as much focus on it as we would anything else. So, um, you know, you're telling a story. I know a lot of family oriented and I know you mentioned the admins and the other groups. Listen, we we try very hard to uh, weed a lot of that out, but, you know, try to 
engaged conversation. And that's the, that's really the point of these podcasts and, and really get your voice out there and, you know, you show activity and, you know, uh, love of a game, you know, any game, you know, basketball, obviously here, uh, baseball life, uh, you know, got two podcasts there um, and football life with Randy Hammond, Matt Bushnell. I know they're going tomorrow night, uh, recapping week 17. Mm-hmm. Hard to say that. I, usually the last week of the season, but we got, you know, two more and we go <laughs> over Antonio Brown, but, you know, lending a voice out to do to the group and, you know, really showing to make a difference. Um, you know, it, no, it's just it's been really good, man. And I know Freddie, listen, um, I, I hear you have, you know, Christmas has been over. I know it's a time for chocolate. I know you, I mean, great reviews about your, uh, uh, your, your chocolate, man. Tell the audience yes. about it, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jakey. Uh, I appreciate your business, man. And I, <laughs> no problem. I'm glad I was able to make it right because I know the first time I, I got it to you it didn't didn't go so well, but I was able to you know, kind of turn it around. Um, yeah, last year I um, I, I watched a video on TikTok from a guy who you know did some uh, tempering of chocolate and how he he, he was a uh, pastry chef and he did cakes and they just weren't going so well, so he learned how to make candy bars and uh, did a TikTok video and went viral. I was like, this is really cool. I showed my wife, I was like, hey, what if we do that? You know, like if I did this with you, because I always have these ideas. Um, I'm always trying to do something. Like I, I, I get restless after a while. So I'm just like, okay, <laughs> but you know, maybe I do this, maybe I do that. Um, so I said this to my wife, I was like, hey, if I start learning how to temper chocolate and do candy bars, would you want to partner with me on this? And she just immediately said, yes. I'm like, okay. So it was around this time last year that I started putting the idea in motion. I started getting molds. Uh, we were preparing. We live in Georgia now. We were in uh, South Florida then. So we were prepping. Um, we waited until we moved to Georgia until we figured out where we were going. And then we started buying the materials. Um, I researched, you know, um, chocolate. I found a nice Belgian chocolate um, brand that I really liked. Found some molds that I liked. And uh, we ordered some chocolate and we just went ahead and did it. And we're like, oh, this is really good. Oh, this is dark chocolate. Okay, let's see how it is with milk chocolate and white chocolate and stuff like that. So we get some comfort other ones. And it's like, I think we can do this. And so I named it Harper Rose Sweet Shop um, after my two daughters, Emmeline Harper and Eliana Rose. So they're middle names, Harper and Rose, um, because, you know, I grind for my girls. I, I do what I can to make sure that my girls are taken care of. And one day I want to be able to build this thing and, you know, build it strong enough to where it could be a freestanding unit. So, you know, I can start putting some money in their savings accounts and so that they don't have to worry about anything when they want to do whatever it is, mm-hmm. college, trade school, backpack through Europe. I don't care. Um, so I started it last year and surprisingly, it took off and it went really well and we had a good four or five months. And then, you know, in the summer it died down because it's the summertime. It's really hard to sell chocolate in the summer. So Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't able to regroup. um, And so I had to take another job just to kind of, you know, make sure we're taken care of, but I want to, you know, I'm going to get back into it. Um, Valentine's day is coming up. So we are going to be making some, you know, custom hearts and stuff, you know, custom bars. Uh, We're going to do some date boxes and stuff like that, you know, (laughs) Uh, send you some, send you a box, you know, you have like a hot cocoa mix and mix, you know, like a recipe for you to make a dinner, um, some champagne and stuff like it, it's going to be really nice. So we try to put some mock-ups on the website really, really soon so that we can take orders because, you know, we'll probably need to have orders placed within the next three to four weeks so that it can go out on time um, and make sure it gets there for Valentine's Day. But yeah, we're going to kick things back off. And, uh, you know, try to go strong with that. But, yes, Harper Road Sweet Shop, www.hrsweets.com. We do have a uh, page on Facebook. And, uh, you know, just, you know, hit me up if you are interested in anything custom, whatever. And uh, we'll try to take care of your needs for sure. That's great, man. Do it. Yeah, absolutely. Get some chocolate for your ladies. Get some chocolate for uh, – Girl, uh, like I said, Valentine's Day coming up. My man here does. He's going to shoot a link in the group. Going to shoot a link throughout the groups. Uh, if you're listening, got the website down. Uh, 
always good stuff, Freddie. And uh, you're a man of many talents. Uh, I hear, you know, music is one of them. You mm-hmm. coming from CPT, who's your, uh, who's your favorite artist, man? <sighs> okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, this is kind of blasphemy or whatever, but, like, you know, obviously West Coast, you know, you, you should, like, Tupac and, you know, West Side Connection, NWA and stuff like that. You know, and, and those are all great or whatever. But, like, my, mm-hmm. you know, like, growing up, uh, mid-90s and stuff like that, Biggie was probably my favorite rapper. Like, I mean, he was just, you know, like, Tupac was a poet. But, like, it was just the way that, you know, <laughs> that, that, that Biggie was able to flow his words and the way that he delivered them and stuff. Like, you know, it's just always a flow. He went with the beat and stuff like that. It was, it was really dope. Um, you know, I mean, I, it's really hard for me to try to pinpoint who I really like because it's just kind of all over the place. Jay-Z is mm-hmm. great. Eminem is great. Um, like I said, Pac is good. Biggie's good. You know, like I'm, it's really hard for me to connect with the artists of the current time. And then it just makes me feel like an old head, but I guess that's just what I am because it's Agreed. just the, the beats are slower. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some of them are rapping a little bit faster, but it just seems very, very watered down. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like they're reaching their potential. And that's fine. Cause like for us, our rap or whatever, wasn't the same as the rap that came out, you know, the decade before when, mm-hmm. you know, it was a little bit more about the struggle and stuff like that. And, you know, and it's just, it, everything just keeps morphing. I just really feel like the, the sweet spot of, you know, rap was early nineties to early two thousand. Like that, mm-hmm. that one decade there was probably the best that rap was. And I think it's, you know, for the, for the most part now, um, they're struggling to keep a grasp on it, whatever. I, you know, no, more power to people that can listen to it and everything like that. I just, I'm just not that. <laughs> I'm not that guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I agree. Listen, shout out to uh, to Betty White. Um, Thanks. Oh man, lost a, lost a real one there. I mean, yeah, New, New Year's Eve. That's you know, again, damn you, TMZ. <laughs> yeah, seriously, they they really keep like revealing this shit way too early. Like y'all need to chill mm-hmm. out. Like they broke my heart with Michael Jackson. They did it with you know with, with Kobe, Betty White. Like it's just like okay, y'all are, y'all are too good at your job. Like calm the fuck down. But like <laughs> that one hurt. I mean that one hurt a lot because we're sitting there. All right, she's almost a hundred. She's almost mm-hmm. there. Bam, dies. And I thought it was a joke because you know for years it was a uh, Betty White dies at home, but it was D Y E. Someone's just kind of mm-hmm. making a joke, whatever. And then there was that, uh, that TikTok song that like, went popular, the Woke Kenny one. It was like, shout out to Betty, uh, RIP to Betty White. She's not dead, but she's going to be, you know, I know she's dying soon. Like, mm-hmm. Why are you foreshadowing this stuff? Like, like don't put, up. like, that's one not to play around with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Shut the hell up. Oh. My <laughs> wife, she's a huge Golden Girls fan. She goes mm-hmm. to sleep, you know, watch it, like, every night. I kid you not. Um, if I have to crash downstairs because my knee is killing me or whatever, I know I can hear the theme song upstairs, man. Like, every <laughs> single night she watches it. Uh, to go to sleep. It's just like, is that her background noise, man? She loves the girls. So she was really heartbroken for uh, Betty White's death, man. Like, yeah, for sure. We lost a, lost a truly talented person there. Oh, I mean, uh, theme song. I mean, I hear you got some, uh, you got some tunes. Give us a little, yeah. a little bit of the theme song, man. That's what I heard. That, through the grapevine. <laughs> oh, the theme song? The Golden Girls one? Mm-hmm. Uh. <laughs> Thank you for being a friend. Going up the road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a pal and a confidant. I'm not singing it anymore because I shouldn't know the whole theme song. But you know, <laughs> and that was that was enough. That was and dope. That, that was. <laughs> Oh, oh man, man Freddie! I, I retired. I, I don't sing anymore, man. I retired. No, uh, <laughs> that voice man that was, that was Brian McKnight of this bitch, man. What the? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> all right, now you're playing. Uh, <laughs> oh no. man, man, it, listen, it's it's been real, real fun having you on. Um, I I know we'll do this again, and like, thank you for all your contributions within the group, throughout all the life groups, and mm-hmm. and thank you for taking the time out uh, to talk with us, man, you know, bullshit and whatnot. My man, Freddie Forte, a man of many talents. Thank you. Absolutely. Check him out yeah. on Instagram, too, because it's funny as shit. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, be dying. Oh, you know, I was sitting there working my office. I was like, oh, this motherfucker. Wow, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I'm so glad uh, Instagram is much more lenient, man. Because I mm-hmm. keep earning Facebook bands like a motherfucker on there. I'm like, <laughs> I don't even saying anything more anymore, man. I just I type one word, bam, thirty days. So like Instagram, mm-hmm. you know, TikTok and stuff like that. I'm able to say you know things a little bit more and you know kind of get away with it more. And I use mm-hmm. the censoring app so that you know I don't I don't offend people with some of the words I say. But yeah, like I, I do enjoy that. Yeah, you know, if you can find me, find me. Uh, you know, you know, I'd love to make more <laughs> friends out there and just connect or whatever. I, I love having fun and just doing silly shit. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I, I love your war on uh, Christmas. Listen, we celebrate holidays. In <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That shit pisses me off. I'm, that's a rant right there. I need to start doing my material because uh, it's January. Uh, me and Corey, we do one called New Year's Resolution. And the resolutions are stupid. Usually I just do like troll stuff. I think I said, um, what was it? I think it was what fine bugle boy jeans and like people start cracking yo, up. Like, yo, just find it. Like I'm just random with it, man. Like I mean, I if like most can... of the stuff. <laughs> exactly, you can find them, man. Yeah, actually, send them, send them my way, you know. But yo. me, man, I I'm anti everything on purpose. Like people think, <laughs> oh, like I'm madly in love with candy corn. I'm not. I eat it maybe once in October. I just troll the shit out of everybody because they hate it. Like, that's a stupid thing to be upset about. Then I troll everybody who celebrates Christmas before Thanksgiving. That one does piss me off, but, you know, it is what it is. And then for Christmas or whatever, there's not really much to do there because it's the holiday. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we just we just find things that ruin Christmas and just find random yeah. stories and say, this will probably ruin it and stuff. But now we're going to do the same thing for New Year's and call it the New Year's resolution and stuff. So oh, I'm going to try to get – I need to get my material going soon. But, yeah. I'm in some um, bugle, boy. I ain't getting over that. Yo, what's next, Paco? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Paco, Fubu, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, we're gonna hit them all up. Cross colors, yes. Oh, man, if I can find dope. cross colors, that, that was dope. Would be hilarious. Oh man, cross colors, yeah. That that's old. That, that man, that was like ninety two, ninety three when that shit mm-hmm. popped. Yeah. Oh man, it, it's this has been loads of fun. Thank you again, Freddie. Thank you, Jacob, for you know bringing your time out. Uh, you can. Listen to our podcast on Anchor, Spotify, uh, Apple, iHeartRadio. Uh, pretty sure there's some more out there. Apple, I probably said that one already. And subscribe <laughs> to the Life Group Podcast Network on YouTube if you want to catch our beautiful faces. Absolutely. If you don't like us, you're some dusty ass bitches. Yeah, right, I said it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll sign up on that. <laughs> Oh, man. Another great episode in the books. Thank you guys again. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time, everybody, go bow out.